Good evening, America, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I know that some of you struggled with economics in high school and college, and I did too. Uh, but tonight, I think we're going to have an interesting show with economists who speak to the needs of ordinary people and have wonderful careers in fighting for justice uh, and for creating a nation and a government which works for all and not just the few. So in a few minutes, you're going to hear from Dr. Stephanie Kelton. Uh, Stephanie is a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University in New York. She is a leading expert on modern monetary theory, a former chief economist for the U.S. Senate Budget Committee, and served as a member of the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force. So we're delighted to have Stephanie Kelton with us. We're also uh, going to have uh, Professor Robert Reich, who is a professor of public policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and Bob served as Secretary of Labor, the United States Secretary of Labor from 1993 to 1997. Uh, Bob is co-founder of Inequality Media, which educates the public about inequality and the imbalance of power in the United States. And we're also delighted to have an old friend, Dr. Derek Hamilton, who is a professor of economics and urban policy at the New School. In New York City. Derek was an advisor for our presidential campaign, and thank you very much for that. And he served as a member of the Biden Sanders Unity Task Force and has helped create important economic proposals, uh, including the federal jobs guarantee. Uh, before I introduce uh, our guests, let me uh, just say a few words uh, about where we are, in my view, economically. Uh, we live in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, extraordinary wealth. But unfortunately, we also have more income and wealth inequality today than we've had uh, in 100 years. And that means that the people on top are doing phenomenally, phenomenally well, uh, while the working class of this country continues to struggle despite huge increases in recent years in worker productivity. So what you have in America today is two people who own more wealth than the bottom 40%. You got the top 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 90%. You have that wealth converted into political power because billionaires and large corporations hire literally thousands of lobbyists here in the nation's capital and all over this country to make sure that the rich continue to get richer. But meanwhile, out in the hinterlands, we are actually seeing in many parts of this country, above and beyond the COVID pandemic, a decline in life expectancy. And what some of the scientists tell us, tells us, tell us is that that has to do with what we call diseases of despair. People are giving up. They're going nowhere in their lives. Their kids are going nowhere. They have jobs to pay starvation wages. Uh, and they're turning to drugs. They're turning to alcohol. And sometimes even unbelievably, they're turning to suicide. And that's, that's the extreme. But in addition to that, you've got a half a million Americans in this wealthy country who are homeless. We have families all over this country who are paying 15 or 20 percent of their incomes uh, for childcare. Think about that. You know, you want to go to work, you spend 15, 20 percent of your income for childcare. We have old people throughout this country who can't afford the prescription drugs that they need. Some of them don't have any teeth in their mouth. They can't afford hearing aids. They can't afford eyeglasses. You got kids who are struggling to afford to get a higher education. Everyone says, get a higher education, get a higher education. And yet they leave school fifty, hundred thousand dollars in debt. You want to go to graduate school? Could be a couple of hundred thousand dollars in debt. And on top of all of that, you know, all of that despair and anger and frustration, uh, you got problems like climate change uh, and racism and sexism and homophobia and so forth and so on. So what tonight is about is to take a hard look at where the economy is today, what's working, what's not working. 
maybe talk a little bit about how our economy and what we focus on, what our priorities are compared to other countries around the world. And I think, as many of you know, we are the remain the only nation on earth, major nation on earth, not to guarantee health care to all people is the human right. And we are the only country, virtually the only country in the world without paid family and medical leave, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so at the end of the day, what we want to talk about is, is get an understanding of why we are where we where we are, the role that greed plays in our economy, and most importantly, where do we go from here? So I'm just so proud and happy that we have uh, three great economists uh, with us uh, tonight uh, to discuss uh, these issues. Uh, and let me begin uh, by starting off uh, with uh, with all three of them to comment on the state of the economy today. We're hearing a lot about inflation, wage increases. What's going on in the economy today? Who wants to uh, jump into that discussion? All right, Bob, I see you ready to get going. Bob Rice, okay. you want to jump in on that? I, I, I will jump in. I will jump in. In terms of inflation, uh, there are three things going on. Uh, and let's be clear about it. You know, number one, you've got a lot of pent up demand from this pandemic. People did not buy. Uh, they couldn't. Uh, they were scared to go into malls. And as the pandemic starts receding, there's a huge wave of demand. That's number one. Number two, you've got supply bottlenecks, uh, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Uh, and we know that. We see that at ports. Uh, we see it in terms of uh, what OPEC is doing. We see it in terms of uh, really uh, uh, bottlenecks that are obvious because you just can't get enough computer chips for the cars. And those bottlenecks are driving up prices as well. But there's a third factor that is not being paid nearly enough attention to, Bernie, and that is something that we've talked about before and Stephanie and Derek have talked about and written about, and that has to do with economic concentration in big corporations. Because you've got right now record levels of corporate profits, record profits. Now, if they were competitive, if they were really in a competitive market, they would not simply be raising their prices. They would be doing everything they could to reduce or keep their prices so they didn't lose consumers. But the fact of the matter is they can raise their prices because they have market power, because they are monopolists or they are oligopolists. They are not really competing. Uh, and that is something that nobody is talking, to my way of thinking, nobody's talking about enough. Uh, this is a big structural problem right at the center of the American economy. Concentration of ownership. Concentration of market power. And that market power means monopolization. The food prices are going up. Why are they going up? Between, because there's a handful of food processors, processors a handful of, of, of food, you know, seed and fertilizer companies, they are not competitive. They can just pass on all of their cost increases and still make record profits. That's what's going on. Stephanie, what's your sense of the economy today? Well, you know, I think it's, for me, I always try to put things in the context of where we were, what we're coming out of, and where we might have been, but for many of the legislative successes that we had over the course of the last 18 months ago. So, you know, compared to where we were a year ago today, when we didn't even have emergency use authorization for the COVID vaccine, we are in really good shape on a number of fronts. Back then, COVID cases were surging and the recovery was starting to slow in part because of the virus, but also because the CARES Act, which Congress passed at the very beginning of, of the pandemic was starting to wear out. The unemployment benefits were running out. The payroll protection program that was help keeping, uh, helping to keep small businesses afloat, keep workers on payroll, that program was rolling off. The $1,200 checks that went out, those had mostly been spent out and the economy was slowing. And a year ago, we had basically one in five workers who was either unemployed, underemployed, or had suffered a pay cut since the pandemic began. We, we were watching food banks that were still overwhelmed and food insecurity was soaring, especially in black and Latino households. 
We saw uh, food insecurity in families with children, 40 million Americans at risk of eviction. Half of all small businesses said they didn't expect to be around a year from now. They thought they were going under. Um, schools weren't reopened and hundreds of thousands of women had dropped out of the labor force to stay home to care for kids. Parts of the country were going back into lockdown. We had wildfires raging across California, Oregon, Colorado, and things were a mess. And then we got the Delta variant, and that kind of knocked us back a little bit. But at the end of the day, Congress came back and you gave us a $900 billion package in December of last year. And then we got the American Rescue Plan this March, that $1.9 trillion package that came and gave the economy a real boost. So today where we are, I think, is we have the vaccine. And in spite of the Delta variant, in many ways, the economy has been performing well. In fact, in some ways, it's been booming and the unemployment rate is down 4.6%. We're adding back a lot of jobs. Workers are enjoying some bargaining power that they haven't seen in a very long time. We're seeing wage increases, especially at the bottom of the income distribution. And, you know, families that are in good financial shape are buying a lot of goods. And this gets to what Bob just talked about. You're seeing the effects of all of that spending in, you know, backlogs and supply chain uh, problems, getting goods to the marketplace and so forth. But all things considered, as you said at the beginning, you know, we have a lot of serious problems in our economy, um, but we are doing so much better today than we were a year ago. Derek, what's your sense of the state of the economy? Yeah, I mean, relative to a year ago, there's no question we're doing much better, but we still have a long way to go. But we still need to expand our social safety net to make us more resilient to the next time we have an economic crisis. Um, but one of the reasons we're doing much better and that we had a pretty short recession in a historical sense was the manner, just like Stephanie pointed out, in which government intervened. We intervened this time where we directly uh, put stimulus into our most treasured resource, which is our people. We didn't have that firm centric approach that we had in years past, but rather we met people where they were. We ensured economic security. We ensured their health and safety. And not only did that uh, allow people to thrive and, and not suffer immensely, um, it stimulated our economy in a way that, that's leading to this boom that when you empower people, when you offer them resources, they can not only utilize their ingenuity in a growth manner, but they also do it in a way that is more fair, more just. Um, and then let me say one other thing, Senator, that, that you kind of brought up earlier um, when talking about the right to health care. The right side of the political aisle likes to emphasize individual rights, property rights, um, now, they don't fulfill it, civil rights and political rights, but, but we talk a lot about individual rights. When talking about human rights, it is disingenuous if you talk about human rights without economic rights. If you engage in any transaction with no resources, you are at the whim of exploitation or the whim of charity. So what I like about the ways in which our government began to reverse history from the ways in which we've been intervening for the past 50 years is that we focused on people. We focused on providing resources so that pe people can thrive and our economy can boom in a more prosperous, shared way. All right, Derek raised um, an issue dear to my own heart. And Bob, maybe I'll throw it to you as well. When he talks about economic rights as human rights, you know, in our country, we say, well, you know, we have freedom, you can vote. You have freedom of religion. You have, you know, you walk on a picket line, you could dissent and all of that. But economic rights is, is something a little bit different. In your judgment, are economic rights human rights? Uh, yes, uh, and you can't separate the two. I mean, in other words, if you have somebody who doesn't have access to health care, access to education, access to what people need in order to succeed, uh, then they don't have any economic rights and they don't have any human rights. Uh, why create this false distinction between the two? Uh, I want to just, uh, Bernie, if I can, agree wholeheartedly with what Stephanie and Derek have said about this economy today being far better than it was a year ago. 
but I want to distinguish between the business cycle, that is, things going up and down. We are much better off than we were uh, in the recession. We are much better off because the pandemic, hopefully, is mostly behind us. Uh, but there is also a deep structural problem in the economy that we have not yet tackled. And I'm going to embarrass you, Bernie Sanders, for a minute because you have been in the lead on voicing and moving on this structural problem. And the structural problem is widening inequality. Uh, you mentioned at the start that we are, we, the problem is a vicious cycle in which as wealth and income concentrate at the top, more and more political power also concentrates at the top, which means that the people who have the wealth and the corporations that also have the wealth, that power to change the market, change the system to give them even more wealth and make it harder for everybody else to get any kind of human rights or economic rights. And, and the reason I want to bring this up, Bernie, is you are right now in the middle of this. We, are, we have this fierce fight. The Republicans, you know, they, they are in the pockets of big business and the wealthy. Uh, and we have some Democrats that may be in their pockets as well. Uh, the test is going to come very soon. Uh, but we as a nation are doing very little for our people compared to what other rich nations are doing. We are the richest nation in the history of the world, and yet half of our people have not had a raise, just in terms of wages in 40 years of adjusted for inflation. Most of the gains of the economy have gone to the top. And what we have to do and what we need to do is give them the wherewithal. I mean, in terms of childcare and healthcare and, and paid family leave and, uh, uh, you know, affordable pharmaceuticals and all of the things that make it possible for them as individuals to live a decent life. Uh, and, and this is, this, this, this is, this should be beyond any debate. I mean, the fact that we're debating this is, is quite absurd. Quite frankly, Bob, let me jump in. I, I, I would like um, Stephanie or Derek or to talk a little bit about what goes on in other countries in terms of providing uh, for the basic needs of working families. Stephanie, if I'm a, uh, a mom in, in Scandinavia, Norway, Denmark, uh, and I have a baby, uh, what happens? Well, you're going to have to work. Go ahead. You're going to have a lot of time off, Senator. Uh, you're going to have more than 24 weeks of paid leave if you're a new mom. And in countries around the world, fathers get paid leave, too. There are only 83 countries in the world. And we're, of course, one of them who doesn't offer paid leave to new fathers. When it comes to new mothers, the U.S. is one of just seven countries around the world that doesn't uh offer as a right paid maternity leave. I mean, some of these countries that, that are like us are so tiny. They're little island nations. You can barely find them on the map. In other words, virtually the entire world has found a way to do this. And we are the outlier here at a whopping zero weeks of paid leave for new mothers. It's a national embarrassment. And in terms of health care, there are how many major countries on earth do not guarantee health care to all people as a right? Well, of the leading economies in terms of income, I know of only one, that would be us, uh, which, which is sad. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of some optimism, social movements are pushing us where we're, 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 I'm optimistic we can get there. So, you know, there's, there is some silver lining in this pandemic in that we showed what government can do. And then, you know, the other big point is that this didn't just happen. There were social movements that have been building. So all this stuff that's going on in other countries, this inequality uh, and despair, it's not natural. It's not inevitable. There are actually things we can do. And I'm glad you're pointing to international context as examples. And we can even look historically in our own country as at least some inklings of examples that, that we can actually do this and stimulate the economy at the same time. Okay, let me jump to one of the issues which many parts of the country are wrestling with right now, and that's labor shortage. Okay, go to uh, my state of Vermont, go to the city I live in, shop after shop, workers wanted, uh, you know, 
uh, bonuses, et cetera, et cetera. Why do we have uh, a labor shortage today? So, so, Eric? You know, let, let's even add a little context. You, you can have a scenario of no jobs. You can have a scenario of good jobs and a scenario of bad jobs. So the fact that we see some workers willing to negotiate for better terms and not willing to put up with, with anything that an employer offers them, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. And, and I'm grateful for an expansive social safety net, like during the pandemic, offering extended unemployment benefits so people don't just have to take anything. I think the key phrase is, we want good jobs. We want jobs with dignities. We want job with living wages. We want safe jobs. It, it, otherwise, a bad job might be worse than no job. Stephanie, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think it's it, in many cases, I think we would all probably agree that it's not a labor shortage. It's that employers are not offering the wages and benefits that are, would require uh, be required to bring a person back into the labor force in the middle of still an ongoing pandemic. And we've all seen the images on TV. Who wants to you know, wait tables or work in a hotel when you see, in some cases, people being very abusive to wait staff. You've got anti-maskers out there. You see people getting spit on and punched in the face. We're asking a lot of these people to take many of these jobs where they have to deal with a population, many of whom just frankly behave very badly. It's scary. You're in a pandemic. You got to deal with hostile people sometimes and you do it for really uh, crappy wages. Not to mention the danger of getting COVID, right. being exposed to COVID. Yeah, I, I, I think that the uh, the expression labor shortage ought to be retired. Uh, I, I think it's, it's an expression that is put out by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other groups that want to deflect attention from what's really going on. It's not a labor shortage. It's a shortage of of decently paid job, livable wages. It's a shortage of, of jobs that have benefits attached to them. It's a, it's a shortage of, uh, of people who, who have uh, the kind of childcare they need in order to get the jobs. It, it's, a, it's a shortage of safety and safe jobs. I mean, a lot of American workers right now are waking up to the fact that they live in a system that has the cruelest form of capitalism in the world and treat average workers the worst of, of workers that are in any other advanced country. And they're saying to themselves, look, we're not going to take it anymore. You know, like in that old film, I'm not going to take it anymore. People are saying, I'm, gonna, I'm either going to go on strike or I'm going to look for a better job or I'm going to quit. I'm just, I don't have to do this. I don't work, uh, you know, I, I don't live to work. I, I work to, to live. Uh, and a lot of people are reconsidering, particularly after this horrific pandemic, a lot of people are just simply reconsidering their lives. I, I mean, if, and if I could jump in real quick, we'd be remiss to not point out race and gender when we think about unemployment numbers. The black unemployment number is still 7.9%. So uh, I, that would hardly classify as um, a, a, a low unemployment. And then we'd also be remiss to not point out that the employment, the population rate is still below 60%. So there's still 40% of people that are out of the labor force altogether, for example. Uh, so the, the numbers themselves, obviously everybody agrees that the, the criteria isn't just any job, it's a good job. But even if we use the criteria of no job, is you know, th these numbers need to be put in context. And, and one more thing, Senator, I think we need to do away with the term natural rate of unemployment altogether. What does that mean? It's a moving target. that's almost a, a political jargon that, that's put forth. Of course, we could talk about Econ 101, what, what natural rate of unemployment means. But at the end of the day, the natural rate of unemployment is anybody who desires a job has a job. All right. As all of you have mentioned, Congress President now in the middle of a fierce, underlying the word fierce, uh, debate over a reconciliation package called Build Back Better. Uh, why should we pass that legislation? What should it have in it? Stephanie? Well, it, at a minimum, it should have had what you envisioned when the agreement was $3.5 trillion, which 
I, I mean, I was with you all the way, Senator. I, that To me, that was a compromise number. I thought $6 trillion was a much better number. And to be honest, I did a piece for the New York Times in which I thought $10 trillion was an even better number. So what should be in it? A lot more climate to start with. But uh, look, there were some very good things. And that three and a half trillion dollar proposal. And again, I think it's important to remind people that this is over 10 years. So it is frankly a modest proposal. $350 billion is not a lot of money in an economy that is going to generate some $300 trillion over the next decade. This is modest. Okay. So, but but in spite of the fact that it's modest, there were some really good things that you wanted to do, including paid family and medical leave at 12 weeks, which would bring us much closer to what the uh, international community already does. Um, you know, much more on the climate side. That was important. On healthcare, you wanted dental, hearing, and vision, and expansion of Medicare. This should be a no brainer. The negotiation of prescription drug prices, something virtually the entire population understands and supports. And the list goes on. So there, there were so many things. I think the investments in climate, for me personally, come very close to the top. And the expansion of the child tax credit, that has to be given priority in this legislation. You did it once. You lifted almost half of the kids in this country out of poverty. Why on earth would you let them slip back in? Well, I just want to re reiterate what Stephanie just said. And I think it doesn't get a lot of attention and people may not appreciate what we accomplished. But this is what good public policy can do. For years, all of us, Bob, you and I and, and Derek and Stephanie have been talking about the outrageously high level of childhood poverty in America, correct? Richest country on earth, we had the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. And you know what we did with that one bill? We cut childhood poverty in almost half. And in minority communities, probably more than half. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And that just gives you an indication of what good public policy can do. Um, uh, Bob, uh, Derek, want to jump in on Build Back Better? Thoughts? What do we do? Derek? Yeah, I mean, we said it already, inclusive economic rights. That's the framework. We need tuition-free public colleges and universities. We need to cancel student debt. I mean, when we tell people to better themselves by going to college, we shouldn't saddle them with the albatross of debt. Right. That's immoral. It's immoral. Um, we, we obviously need to build up our public infrastructure, both physical and human infrastructure. We need to, as Stephanie pointed out, make ourselves more resilient to the climate change, which is certainly gonna have ramifications in terms of, of, of inequality. Those marginalized populations that, can, that are ill-equipped to deal with the fluctuations in climate are gonna feel it worse, no fault to their own. And then we also need to build up our human infrastructure. So we need care work. We need to have things like paid family leave. And then, you know, I'm going to end by saying that there, there's good news. I'm, I'm going to say that the work that, that you've been doing, Senator, that this stuff, the fact that we're considering changing our tax code to directly offer people refundable tax credits in the form of a child tax credit, you know, this is the 20th anniversary year of welfare reform. This is a marketed change from when we tried to make poor people jump through all these unnecessary hoops by disciplining them, providing all, all sorts of punitive disciplining approaches to, to just uh, live with dignity. We're now in a framework where we're using our biggest fiscal tool, which is our tax code. We're rethinking it. We're recognizing that it goes well beyond revenue collection, that through that tax code, we can literally eliminate poverty. We can literally eliminate poverty for children. Hell, we can eliminate poverty for everyone. We have the capacity to do so. Bob, correct me if I'm wrong. You're at the University of California, Berkeley. 50 years ago, UC, uh, University of California was virtually tuition free, wasn't it? Back it then? was. It was. And I was there 50 years ago. <laughs> and it was tuition free. Uh, but look, I, you know, a lot of people ask all the time I hear, well, can we afford it as a nation? 
Can we afford Build Back Better? Can we afford, you know, two trillion dollars or three trillion or one point seven five trillion dollars, whatever the final tab is? How can we afford it? Uh, but you know, these numbers mean nothing out of context. Uh, you know, over the next ten years, the military bill is eight trillion dollars. Eight trillion. Does anybody say can we afford eight trillion dollars? Does anybody say we? Oh, look at the uh, look at the possible inflationary impact of eight trillion. Nobody, uh, nobody says that. Well, well, oh, well, funny okay. you mention that, Bob. I can interrupt you. This week, Wednesday, I believe, there's going to be a vote on the defense budget, and uh, it's going to be twenty-five billion more than what Biden originally asked for. Okay, and I think we're going to throw in another fifty-two billion with no strings uh, attached for the micro uh, chip. In industry, and you know what's going to be paid for? Oh, I guess it'll just be added to the deficit. But uh, that's the way life goes, and it'll well, be bipartisan. Have, I mean, the, 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 but you know, just in terms of in terms of our priorities, uh, you know, it's one thing to say military is more important than child care and child poverty and K through twelve and and affordable education and affordable health care. You know, you can have a big debate about that, but but when you consider that. St- Starting with a pandemic, you know, in March of 2020, extending through now, the 750 billionaires in America increased their wealth by $2.1 trillion. That would be enough just there. They, they, they could pay for the entire Build Back America, Build Back Better program. They could pay for that and still be as rich as they were at the start of the pandemic. I mean, this is, this is ludicrous that we're having a debate about this. You know, I mean, Elon Musk, I don't, I, I, I asked myself not to bring him up tonight, but he, just, <laughs> he bubbled up. Elon Musk alone, the richest man in the world, I mean, he could, he could easily, easily afford, uh, you know, ch- everybody, universal childcare, universal health care. Uh, things are so out of whack, Senator. Uh, in terms of our priorities and our funding right now, that it's hard to know even where to begin. Well, what I can tell you is that many of my colleagues live in a very deep, deep bubble, very separated from the realities of the world. And the people they come in contact with have a very, very different outlook than what you have described, Bob, and what we all uh, share. Can I ask you, you a know, question? You, I, if Senator, I can, I just want to tell you a story as a as a practicing politician. You know, I go around the state of Vermont a lot, and you often talk to people, veterans, older people, and I say, you know, do you know we have veterans programs? You're entitled to this. You're entitled to that. And you know what people say to me? Do you know what people say to me? They say, well, yeah, I know I'm entitled to it, but I kind of think there are other people who need it more than I do. I don't need it that badly. Yeah, I'm entitled to it. You come here on Capitol Hill. And you got these billionaires who in some years don't pay a nickel in federal taxes, corporations that enjoy all kinds of loopholes. And you know what? They want more and more and you cannot satisfy them. And they buy politicians and they buy institutions. It's really quite a remarkable thing to see greed in action when you see ordinary people saying, well, you know, other people maybe need it more. Than I well, I'll tell you what, when, when, I was, when I was labor secretary, I used to go around the country uh, to working class places. I, was, I spent a lot of time in West Virginia, for example. I spent a lot of time in, in Arizona and Ohio, and I'd have these meetings with, with working people, and I'd say, what do you need? What are you care- concerned about? They talk about their wages. They talk about child care. They talk about the cost of education. They talk about all these things. And I see now, I don't understand it, senators from these places some of them even Democratic senators from places like, shall we say, West Virginia, where the people I know are desperate. They need a lot of assistance. And yet you have people representing them in, in Washington who don't get it, who, who, who either don't get it or what are they responding to? What are they responding to? Well, I know what they're responding to. But we won't well, I, I think I know what they're responding to, too. All right. Um, we got a bunch of questions that have come in. Um, uh, Danielle asks, will the child tax credit be extended beyond December? 
It has been a huge help. Uh, Danielle, that has everything to do whether the reconciliation Build Back Better bill is passed. Some of us wanted to make that uh, child tax credit permanent. Uh, that is at $300 a month per child, which has gone so far in helping to reduce childhood poverty. We'd like to make it permanent. We wanted to make it 10 years. We wanted to make it five years. I think we're down to extending it right now for one year. Pretty pathetic, but better uh, than nothing. Um, uh, here's a good question from Rachel. Uh, and, and we touched a little bit about it, but it's, it's huge. How does climate change impact the economy? Who wants to jump in on that one? Well, let, let me just say, uh, and this is part of a much larger answer, but when the Congressional Budget Office measures the costs of a policy proposal, as it's doing now with Build Back Better, it does not measure the cost of doing nothing. Climate change is a typical example. Uh, yeah, there is going to be some cost associated with a variety of measures to try to control and contain climate change. But if we don't do anything, right. the cost of flooding, the cost of hurricanes, sea, the increase in the sea levels, wildfires, the cost of, of, of the destruction of, of our physical capacity in this country and the planet as a whole is incalculable. Absolutely. I mean, not to mention drought and crop production, et cetera. Uh, anyone else want to jump in, Derek? I mean, certainly volatility is bad for the economy, uncertainty. But, but you know, we're, we're losing the North Star. If we don't have a planet, we don't have an economy. Health is inseparable from our economic well-being. So to me, you mean it, it, it is somewhat obvious. I mean, in terms of inequality, we know those that are most vulnerable will suffer the most. We, it always happens. I mean, we can, we can see climate gentrification happening right now. We can look at places in Florida where central areas now are housing prices are skyrocketing. So uh, black populations that might have been located in certain areas now are facing skyrocketing prices because the coastal areas are more vulnerable. So, you know, the, the simple answer is, first and foremost, our well-being needs to be taken care of if we're going to talk about any type of economy. Okay. Um, here's a question. Um, it, it's from uh, Matthew. Uh, do you have any words of encouragement in regards to the economy and younger generations? I am 18 and already feel so let down. I mean, here again, this is where optimism comes in. It is our economy. So young people have capacity to change things. Young people through their political organization can agitate and, and lead to change. So, you know, I, I kind of push that question back on Matthew and say, seize your economy. Politicians work for you. <laughs> so seize it, own it, and then reimagine the society that you want. The despair that we currently have is not inevitable. We really can have change. All right, Bob and Stephanie. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't care more. I, I, couldn't, young people. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, go ahead. I couldn't agree more. I think one of the one of the hidden weapons that the radical right and corporate America is using is to make people fatalistic and resigned and uh, just overall cynical about the possibilities for positive social change. Young people, what I love about teaching young people, and Stephanie and Derek, I'm sure you have had exactly the same experience, is that there is not the same degree of cynicism and fatalism and, and, and kind of resignation that you get in the rest of the country right now. You have young people who say, essentially, I'm going to change everything. I, I think I do have the power. We have the power. Uh, my generation has to live with some of these problems for the next 60, 70, 80 years, and we're not going to allow it to happen. And Derek, you're exactly right. This economy belongs to people. We don't work for the economy. The economy should be working for us. And the same with politics. Stephanie, you were, you know, you teach young people every day. What's your sense of where they're coming from there? I think that we're all feeling the same way in the classroom, interacting with our students, that young people are the source of hope. They are still optimistic. I, I 
think Matthew, you know, you you could maybe take comfort in knowing that many people who are in your age category um, are prepared to step up and say, this is not the world that we're going to allow you to leave to us. We have to grow up in this space. And we intend to make the changes that are going to make this a livable planet, an economy that works for all of us. And they're prepared to stand up. I think they're prepared to stand up and fight. I think they're prepared to turn out and vote. And what I hear from young people more and more is that they're not going to sit back and sit this one out, that they understand, especially where climate is concerned, that their futures really are on the line. I mean, commit to justice simply because it's the right thing to do. And through collective efficacy, young people really can make change. Okay, we have a question from Alex, and he asks, how are bil billionaires able to continue to avoid paying taxes? Well, I'll try, I'll try that one first. Uh, one of the techniques, I mean, there are many techniques. One technique is political. That is, they, we've been talking about it. Uh, their platoons of lawyers and lobbyists go to Washington and they basically get loopholes and then they jump through the loopholes. And so they don't have to pay taxes. Uh, what they're also doing is borrowing against their fortunes, uh, using their money, their huge amount of money as what's called collateral to the purpose of borrowing from banks their, their living expenses. And no matter how lavish their living expenses are, that does not count as income. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, last year, for example, Jeff Bezos had a quote unquote income of $81,000. Now that's $81,000. That's, that's what he took from his company, but actually he lives on stocks and stock auctions. Uh, the same thing is true of Elon Musk. Elon Musk recently said he thought it was very unfair. A, a billionaire's tax or a tax on, on very, very wealthy people would, would be very unfair because he actually doesn't get an income. Uh, he doesn't get an income, he said, so it would be unfair. Uh, he would have to take money out of his, out of his stock portfolio, poor fellow. Uh, you see, this is what they do. They get around the income taxes by borrowing against their fortunes. And that's why a wealth tax is critically important. The, the, the things that Bob is talking about are obviously important. Now, these are loopholes like the carried interest loophole, things like step up of basis, which Bob was just describing. But there's also, in addition to their legal ways in which they avoid paying taxes, you know, we don't know because we don't audit them in the numbers that we ought to be auditing. And so even enforcing the tax laws that are already on the books, we don't do a good enough job. And so many of them get away with paying less because, frankly, they don't think they're going to get caught if they don't disclose all of the income. And so one of the things that, you know, you, Senator, and, and others have been talking about is giving the IRS more resources to work with so they can go after tax cheats. And that would cut down on, on at least some of this as well. And there are estimates that we could raise many, many hundreds of billions of dollars every single year by getting the IRS. The IRS commissioner testified that the tax gap, the difference between what people pay and what they should be paying, he put the estimate at a trillion dollars a year. I know CBO and others suggest that you'll capture less than that, but there is a huge amount of money there, very low hanging fruit, just in terms of enforcing tax laws that we already have on the books. And this is not the, the, the important thing is it's it, it, if you if you actually give the IRS what they need to enforce the tax laws, it's not that they're going to go after the average person or the working poor or the or working class. They right now, they don't have the resources to audit the very rich because the very rich have teams of accountants and lawyers that are well paid, that actually are, are there only to avoid the possibility mm -hmm. that the IRS even gets a foot in the, in the door. Uh, and that's why they don't want the IRS to have any more money. That's why they're voting against giving the IRS more resources, because they don't want to be audited. You know, how many years has Donald Trump told us he was audited? I think mm -hmm. it was what? What, six years? He said, oh, no, no, you can't see my tax returns because I'm being audited. Well, in, in point of fact, you know, all, as, as far as we know, he was never audited. And he has, again, a phalanx, a huge platoons of lawyers and accountants that protect him. Well, he ought to be audited. And, and Senator, I, I am so happy that you're the chair of the budget committee because progressives 
don't look to treasury enough. We focus on labor, health, and human services, which is important, but treasury is critical and vital if we want to have a progressive agenda. So tax reform has to be part of our agenda. And, and you know, our good friend, uh, Stephanie, who's right here, I'm talking about her in the third person, wrote a whole book on the capacity of government to pay for things, that our monetary system investing in uh, our treasured assets like its people is something that we can actually do. And, uh, you know, it's not quite a deficit, that it's actually an investment. So she could say a lot more about that. And then finally, I guess, I don't begrudge, and I don't think any of us, nest, well, maybe, but begrudge wealthy people because they're wealthy. What, what the problem is, is their capacity to intervene in our political process in an immoral way. That it's naive to not recognize that economic power can translate into political power. And we have classes of people with way too much economic power that have been able to hijack our political system in a way that does not allow us to thrive and humans to flourish. You know, a hundred years ago, Justice Louis Brandeis, the great Justice Louis Brandeis, um, facing the exact or very similar situation we have now, the first Gilded Age. What did he say? He said, America faces a choice. We can have great wealth in the hands of a few or we can have a democracy, but we can't have both. Well, his words are equally applicable to the second Gilded Age we are now living in. Stephanie, anything yeah, you wanna I, I think even, frankly, the billionaires know this. It wasn't that long ago that people like Ray Dalio, the billionaire hedge fund manager was saying the pitchforks are coming. He looked around and he said, this is too much inequality. This is intolerable. People won't stand for it. And he actually came out and he said, we have to have more progressive taxes at the top. We have to have more spending on programs to lift those at the bottom. We've got to narrow the gap or the pitchforks are coming. So they recognize this is, you know, they recognize that inequality has grown so extreme, both in terms of income and wealth, and that it puts the entire system at risk. Okay. Uh, let me ask a more mundane question, but one I know that is on the minds of people all across this country. And I don't know, uh, and the question is, it's from, uh, I don't have a name attached to it, but what drives rising gas prices? Uh, does the president influence that at all? In other words, people are going into a gas station, they're seeing gas just a few weeks ago. Uh, makes people nervous. Rural states, people drive a lot uh, to get to work, to come home. Uh, why are gas prices rising? What can we do about that? Well, I'll tell you my, my assessment of why gas prices are rising, and it's got at least three drivers. One is the global economy recovered a lot faster than anyone expected. And so demand picks up and supply is attempting to catch up in terms of production. One answer is geopolitical, and it has to do with the fact that countries like Saudi Arabia are using this as an opportunity to raise oil prices. And the third reason is that energy is a commodity with a financial ecosystem, AKA Wall Street and speculation and things like oil futures have been driving oil prices and energy costs significantly higher. So all of these things together are driving energy prices and that then feeds into a whole host of, you know, transportation costs and drives other uh, goods prices higher as well, food prices and other things. What there's, can... there's also There is also quite a lot of evidence that oil and gas producers in the United States faced with a choice between raising their productivity and their supply or letting prices go up for a while and actually getting a big fat profit off those price increases have chosen the latter uh, because there's just more, too much concentration of power in those oil and gas producers. What can the president, uh, Derek, do you want to jump in? Both of those answers spot on. The only thing I'll add is if we wane ourselves off of fossil fuels, if we invest in renewable clean energy, then we'd be less vulnerable to those spikes in energy prices. Correct. Uh, what can the president do? What can Congress do right now while we move to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel? 
because that's not going to happen tomorrow. Somebody's driving 100 miles a day. They're paying a lot more for gas. What can we do to help that person? Uh, we could tap into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, or uh, in fact, uh, even threatening to use that could have a positive damper influence on uh, fuel prices. Well, keeping the economy strong is a pretty important thing that you can do. And passing this reconciliation package that keeps support going for families with kids, allows parents to go to the gas station, put gas in the car, have a little bit of extra money made available through things like the child tax credit that does help take the pinch out and bringing down other costs for them. So if they're paying a bit more to fill the tank every week or every couple of weeks, but they're paying a bit less for things like childcare and other expenses, college education and so forth, then that's something you can do to help take the sting out of the budget for families until oil prices come down. I suspect they're gonna come down in the very near term. Yeah, I mean, economic terms like inflation are often used as scare tactics, and I'm not trying to diminish some of the harms and problems associated with inflation, but at the root of it, we care about purchasing power as Stephanie is describing, the ability to have resources to purchase vital goods and services. So when thinking about the large context, what we've had over the last 50 years is a shift in purchasing power to a wealthy class while real worker wages have been flat and things like housing prices and energy prices have crept up. So we need a new structure you know, where we really focus on the purchasing power of, of uh, the working class and, and various other people, not just an elite billionaire class. If you're paying but, less oh, for prescription drugs, less for housing, less for childcare, less for education, you are doing a great deal to help families who are struggling with higher energy costs. How does, you know, one of the issues we're dealing with in Build Back Better uh, that all of you have talked about is the issue of childcare. So when we talk about childcare, it's kind of a no-brainer that we want to make sure that our little kids get the best intellectual and emotional um, treatment, not treatment's the wrong word, uh, environment uh, that we can. We want to pay childcare workers, have skilled, dedicated childcare workers who are earning good wages. But what is the impact? What we don't talk about a whole lot, above and beyond the needs of the children, what role does good quality childcare, affordable childcare pay, play in the whole economy? Who wants to jump in on that one? I mean, I think it's always useful to begin with the value proposition, then talk about some of the uh, additional economic spillover effects. So, so at the root of it, every child should be, you know, we all, we, we, a lot of us have children and we, we should have properly cared for children just as a values proposition. But in addition to that, um, women are often relegated to care work, so they will have gender gender promoting uh, attributes as well. And then people can make a decision where they can actually afford to go to work and not be faced with a decision of, well, I can't go to this job because I can't afford childcare. So you have multiplying effects associated with providing childcare that can stimulate economic activity well beyond the actual care that's provided in the first place. I think that's right. The typical family today with children, uh, young children, is spending something between 20 and 30 percent of their income on child care. Now, think about cutting that expense out of the typical family budget. That gives them, as Stephanie was talking about a moment ago, more discretionary income. Do the same thing with prescription drugs, which whose prices are just soaring. Do the same thing with all of these expenses that people have that would be alleviated by the Build Back Better uh, plan. Uh, you know, this th there is no better uh, antidote to inflation than cutting many of these costs. All right, uh, we are. Uh, close to running out of time. Anything that we did not go over that one of you would like to uh, add to the discussion? Derek, I see you smiling. Anything on your mind? It, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, we, we are reverberating chorus. You know, I, I guess the, the thing that I would want to emphasize is that 
you know, we have a lot of despair, but I see a lot of optimism. I mean, I think we have provided precedent that government can actually do good. I mean, the, there's silver lining associated with this pandemic. People got direct checks from Treasury to deal with their uh, th- their economic circumstance, and those checks also pr- produce a vibrant economy. So, so there's a lot of good news here too that we can also focus on and talk about. Well, I also wanted to mention, and again, the uh, we are waiting to see what happens with Build Back Better in the House, and then it comes to the Senate. Uh, but as it now stands, and I, I say this to the young people out there, there is a hell of a lot of money uh, on a program called the Civilian Climate Corps. And at a time when I think young people especially uh, understand how important it is to transform our energy system to make sure that the planet remains habitable for the future generations, we have tens of billions of dollars focusing on jobs for young people plus educational benefits in order for this generation to roll up its sleeves and help us transform our energy system. So when Dara talks about a sense of optimism, that is something that I think a lot of young people will feel very, very good about. That's great. Uh, If I could just add to that, You know, we have these two disciplines that are artificially separated. One is called economics. The other is called politics or political science. They actually are the same. Uh, And what young people need to understand, in fact, not just young people, but everybody watching and Senator Bernie Sanders, you have done more to educate people in this country about the point I'm about to make than anybody. And that is that you get an economic system that is fair and just because you politically organize and mobilize and energize people to demand that system. If you don't, if you don't have that countervailing political power, the power stays with the wealthy, the big corporations, and the system gets even less responsive to the needs of average people. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And Bob, if I could add one more element to that equation, politics and economics are inseparable, but neither is group-based stratification. That if we want to understand how we got to this point today, it was largely the result of demonizing populations. We're, we're able to be less empathetic towards poor people when we racialize them, when we describe them as welfare queens, when we defi- describe them as deadbeat dads. In other words, A despotic leader like Donald Trump has a pathway towards political office the more unequal we are. The more unequal we are, the better able fascist arguments can come about to say that however bad your lot in life is, at least you're not them. At least you're not a Mexican. I'm going to build a wall to protect you. So all three of those need to be thought about in an iterative way, and we need to pursue justice first and foremost and make sure that when we do build back our economy, we do it within an intentional, inclusive way. I think uh, that is exactly right, Derek. And uh, let me uh, just say one more thing about this. And that is that if you look at what has happened, particularly over the last 25, 30 years, but even going way back in history, the oligarchy, that is the richest, most powerful establishment portions of American society, have wittingly or unwittingly played a game of divide and conquer. They don't want the working black people and working white people and poor black people and poor white people and uh, people of color generally to come together and look up and see where the wealth and power have gone. They would much rather everybody fight each other. Well, a true social movement, and this is what Martin Luther King was striving for, in his final years, as everybody knows, a true social movement puts everyone together to seek a better life, a better nation, a better standard of living, a better planet. Well, you know what? On that note, Bob just said it all. Uh, Let me thank Stephanie and Derek and Bob uh, for Uh, not only for being with us tonight, but for the great work that they do every day. And let me thank all of you uh, who have uh, watched the program. 
And the point that you heard you know, from all of our panelists is that you can't sit back and moan and groan. You can't sit back and say it's too bad. Uh, the truth of the matter is there are a hell of a lot of more working people than there are billionaires. And if we mobilize, if we come together, if we have a vision as to where we want this country to go, a vision which is based on justice, you know what? We can win this thing. We can win it. But especially in a moment when climate change threatens the entire planet, the one response you cannot have is to simply sit back and give up and uh, allow yourself to live in despair. That just is not acceptable. So let's stand up. Let's fight back. Let's, let's create the kind of nation and world that we know we deserve and that we can become. So thank you all very much. See you soon. Take care. Thank you, Senator.